right, you got your Bibles? Let me see them, please. Physical Bibles, hold them in the air. Well done, well done, well done. Electronic Bibles, can I see those, please? All right. Okay, so for how many of you actually use the Facebook event on social media for today? Hold it up high. How many did not? Get them, Jesus. Okay, so then I thought, I'm going to get creative. And so I thought, I'll put out this thing that says, listen, what are you bringing to the potluck? So the intent is that you put in there, hey, I'm bringing mac and cheese and green bean casserole. Hey, what are you bringing, Frankie? And you tag Frankie in there. And so then it, you see what I'm saying? It's just supposed to keep going. So, that, so now that, see, some of you go, oh, that's what, the, that's what they meant. Okay, so now I'm going to give this a go. So this next week, obviously, we're not meeting this Thursday. Okay, shameless plug. We're not meeting Thursday on Thanksgiving. That's why we're doing Thanksgiving meal today. But for the next Sunday, I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to try that. I need you guys, whenever you see that Facebook event, that you click either attending or interested, whichever one pops up on your phone, and then you need to tag some people on that. Hey, I'm going to be there. I'll see you there. Tag so-and-so, 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 and so-and-so. Does it make sense? Because otherwise, all this graphicking that I'm doing for the birds, you don't need no graphics. So uh, use them wisely, okay? And uh, see if we can make that dog hunt. So for those of you with a Bible, turn to me, please, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Rejoice in the Lord when I feel like it. Oh. Rejoice in the Lord when I get a bonus. And again, I say, rejoice. How many has ever heard the, the phrase, and actually it's, it's Scripture, it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercies endure forever. I think Brad Fluck probably has the award for saying that the most times ever. <laughs> um, it is at least four times in the book of Psalms, and it's a powerful encouragement for us to remember. Now, in marriage class, we have the, the marriage weekend and whatnot, we give reminders, hey, compliment your spouse. Say something nice to them. Call their name when you don't need anything. I'm going to try this side. Obviously, this side is not real happy with their spouse. Let me try this side. So it's an encouragement to remind you to remember, hey, say good things. And if you're, if you're not married, then say it to your kids. And if you don't have kids, then say it to your neighbor, your friends, your, your, your coworkers. Be kind to people. It's a reminder. How many's ever, now my wife has done this to me a number of times, when I'm just a little bit curt, and she'll say, go upstairs, I'll send you some food. What is she saying? You're hangry. It's a combination of hunger and irritation. It's, it's hangry, right? You're, you're a little hangry, so just go upstairs, I'm going to send some food up there. We'll just put it outside your door. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm telling you at all. I know y'all are a lot more holy than that. So when the Scripture says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, it's not saying Oh, when you think about it, oh, if it's convenient for all oh, of you, if you really feel like you want to do that, then do that. It's not what it's saying. It said, oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good. Is there ever a time that God is not good? No. So is there ever a time we should not be giving him thanks? No. Neither passage, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, or rejoice to the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Neither passage asks for the input of how you feel. How many of you, when you wake up in the morning, you go, woo-hoo, I get to go to work? Huh? One. He just got a promotion. You know what I'm saying? So most of us, when we get up, it's like, huh? oh, I got to go to work. Huh? How about, how about when the electric bills do? Woo-hoo, 
write that bill off for og Hallelujah. Nobody is excited about that kind of stuff. Right? If you wait until you feel like it, you'll never do it. Because many times it's the choice that causes the feelings to show up. Oh, uh, when I decide to be in a good mood, I find good things to cause me to want to continue in a good mood. But if I wake up and I, my back's hurting or I just don't feel exactly right or I got a little uh, 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 in my throat, right? And so I've already got a reason to kind of a little bit, just be a little bit irritated. Then everything I'm looking at irritates me. Everything. That car pulled in front of me too early. Huh? It's, 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 it's too bright outside. It's too warm. It's too cold. It's, it's, it's all the stuff the front row complains about. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's all, it's, it's constant. Whatever your attitude is, it seems to attract and draw those types of things. So if we were to just to get up and say, I choose to give thanks to the Lord, why? Because he's good, not because I feel like it, not because my job is great, not because I'm having a wonderful you know, uh, situation with my marriage, not because my kids are well-behaved, but just because he is good, now it changes my perspective and it puts it right. How many has had to adjust your kid's um, demeanor? Huh? You've had to adjust your kid's demeanor. Sometimes we've done that with a belt, with a hand, with a threat, with grounding, whatever. They, to do what? To get their chiropractically moved into a better uh, attitude than what they started off with. So God is saying, listen, you'll have a chiropractic adjustment in the spirit if you'll just simply wake up and give thanks to the Lord. It changes your, your, your mindset and it changes your expectation. Now, I know you're not going to have this problem today because there's such a variety. But how many has ever sat down for a meal that was prepared for you and it was not your favorite meal? <laughs> Liver and onions, tilapia, fried fish, squid, crawfish, Brussels sprouts. Huh? So it's, it's, not, it's not what you enjoy. It's not what your palate craves or says, woo let me have some more of that. There's none of that going on. But you find that if you allow that to take over your attitude, then you're mad at the person that made it, the, the person that bought it, the person that picked it up, the person that grew it in the garden on the other side of the planet. We just get upset at everybody. Why? Because we, we're not really thankful. So why do you suppose that we pray before we eat? Sometimes we do it out of rote or out of habit or out of um, trying to make other people pleased. Let's pray before we eat. And we'll say something along the lines of, Lord, thanks for this food and drink. You know, bless it. My mom will say, cancel that. Sanctify it to the nourishment of our bodies. Don't want to bless it. You know, that kind of thing. And so we get into this habit. Watch, the words were right. But many times the heart behind it is not. How many times have, have you on the phone when you're hanging out with a loved one said, love you, and it's just a habit now. Love you, click. Huh? Instead of, I sure love you. See, I'm going overboard a little bit to prove the point because it started out when you guys were dating. Oh, I just love you, right? And it's somehow over the years of progressed to love you. In fact, many times when, when, it, when love is expressed, hey, love you, we don't even get to love you back. It's kind of a grunt. Huh? huh? Be, because, because we're no longer thankful and grateful for that relationship. Y'all ain't hearing this at all. How ungrateful must we be to get up and complain about anything when Jesus came of his own will and said, hey, I'll be the one because I'm the only one qualified anyway to live a sinless life, to die on the cross, to give my blood, to pour it out in the mercy seat, to go to, to go to hell, grab the keys of death, hell, and the grave, come back, bring victory and restore authority to the body of Christ. I'm going to do all that. And we get up of a morning and say, oh, i got to go to work. We're, we're ungrateful because we forgot the price. How many remembers being a kid on Christmas morning? 
I mean, it didn't matter what you got. It's the fact you got. You know what I'm saying? It, it just did not matter. And so you're waking up in all the Christmas smells. Anybody like to go to Bucky's other than me? I, I'm telling you, no matter what time of year it is, when you walk into Bucky's, it smells like Christmas. It just smell, it smells like Christmas. They're, they're always they're always what do they uh, what do they do with those nuts? Roasting the nuts and stuff. And if you you want a barbecue sandwich, I'm telling you, you need to go to Bucky's. You know what I'm saying? Uh, shameless plug, just send 10%, Bucky. It'll be really good. Okay, so Christmas morning for a kid many times is like that. There's an expectation and a joy because of an event. And is it wrong? No. Should we minimize that? No. But the older we get, the more we should understand that circumstances ought not dictate Joy. Joy. How, how many has ever ridden a motorcycle that was a kickstart? Huh? If you're on a Harley, you don't know what you're doing. You kick it and it throws you, right? But if, if you're on one of those Japanese bikes, you've you got a better chance, you know. But just kicking and kicking and kicking. Why? To, to get the motor running, right? So sometimes Thanksgiving is that kickstart. Because sometimes I have to force, it's not always automatic, oh, it's not always automatic because my battery's not always charged. You ever, you ever try to get on a, on a motorcycle, you got to start it instead of hearing a, rum, 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 rum. It, it, now it's just going to, huh? Not enough juice there. Sometimes there's not enough juice in my life to automatically kick off praise to God, so I have to, I have to force it. So joy is much the same way. Sometimes we have to remember why I'm supposed to have joy. Not over an event, a gift, a raise, a promotion, a, a meal after church. Should we have a little joy for those things? Yes. But that ought not be the substitute for the constant running flow of joy in our lives. The event joy is a precursor or a taste of what we should have in our life as a constant I was pretty proud of myself yesterday morning. I know y'all can't tell by looking at me, but I, I've been known to have somewhat of a temper. Long time ago, long time ago. And uh, I woke up and, and I went to the kitchen and I saw this big puddle and I thought my geriatric dog had left my wife a present. I thought, my goodness, that's a big bladder on that thing. So I took a few more steps, and it was slish, slosh, slish. And I looked down the kitchen, the living room, the dining room, all the way up to the bedrooms. I, I thought the washing machine had give up the ghost. It wasn't. It was the refrigerator. I don't know how long that thing be spewing, but it spewed till it was about that thick on the ground. And... I just know, you guys don't know this about me, but I do. The old me would have been so mad, so mad. Ah! I mean, the Incredible Hulk, you know what I'm saying? Just turning green and ripping stuff and slinging stuff, and I know y'all don't have none of that problem. I understand that. Just telling off of myself. But I found myself getting, <laughs> I mean, water this thick, and I have a little half-gallon shop back. <laughs> ah! Hose that big around, you know, dump it in the sink, go, ah! I mean, I'm doing this for forever because I didn't want to. I didn't want to wake everybody else up, but I thought, you know what? Jesus is gonna come before I finish this. So I'm gonna get some help. <laughs> so I went ahead and woke him up and and, and got. But but I, I I commented about myself later. I thought, you know what? I am so pleased because I honestly believe my wife was totally gracious about it. My son was totally gracious about it. But I really believe that if my attitude had went south, it would have caused theirs to go south. Because we have the ability to set the tone, not only in our life, but to those lives that are attached to us. That's why we're supposed to have joy. Okay? So the joy that Jesus gives is far different from the one that the world gives. And we understand that. Worldly joy is about getting what we want. If I get what I want for Christmas, woohoo, I'm joyful. If I don't, mm-mm. 
But the joy that Jesus gives comes out of a relationship with him. It's not dependent upon externals. That's why some of you are having a hard time praising the Lord. Well, if I didn't feel so bad, I might praise him. If I hadn't got a flat on the way to, if my wife hadn't got up and barked at me, if I, if I hadn't run out of my favorite creamer from my car, if I hadn't, a, all these excuses, right, as to why we shouldn't offer that, that, that praise, it's a problem. It's a problem. Externals can enhance, but should never dictate your joy level. One more time. Externals can enhance, but should never dictate your joy level. We thank God for his provisions, but our joy is found in our relationship with him. That's why Philippians 4 tells us to rejoice in the Lord, in our relationship with him. Notice it doesn't say, Rejoice from the Lord. It says rejoice in the Lord. We too often as believers want to come to God to find out what we can get from him to bring into our realm instead of letting him consume us and become his realm so that everything that we have is in him. Was that too fast? got too many people trying to get stuff from God instead of realizing that everything they want and need is in God. If we would get in God, we'd stop trying to take from him and just rejoice in him. The prophet Habakkuk lived during a difficult time in Israel because Israel had become very unfaithful to God. So Babylon was able to attack and plunder them. Why? Why? Because of Israel's unfaithfulness. Some of y'all say, I just don't know why everything just goes so bad in my life and my job's messed up, my relationship's messed up, my finances messed up, everything, I mean our country's messed up, everything's messed up. Why? Because we have given permission to the enemy to wreak havoc in our lives. You don't open the door to a moose and then expect that the moose is going to wipe its hooves Clippity-clop on into the living room and sit down to watch a little television. If a moose gets in your house, those you guys understand how big a moose is? A moose. Cameron showed me one time before he passed, he showed me this video. He said, do you know how big a moose is? And I said, well, I mean, they're they big. He said, no, they, they're bigger than big. He said, look at this. And this guy went hunting for moose. And he's on the ground at a tree trunk. And he's got his rifle, and he's wearing a GoPro on his head, you know. So everywhere he looks, you know, he's watching for a moose. And he hears something behind him, and he looks up like this, and a moose was behind him. The moose was so big, it reached down, and it bit his head off at the neck. All on video. Don't none of y'all get on YouTube right now. Oh, my goodness. I'm just saying, here's the thing. I didn't understand that moose were that big. Did you? Here's our problem. We don't understand how messy the enemy is. We don't understand how big and bad he is. And we think that just because I gave just a little bit of room here the other day, one little bit of room is all he needs to slide in and trash your house. So God had to teach Habakkuk to trust him regardless of the circumstances. Do you know that 60% of my job as pastor would be finished if the house would learn this principle, no matter what the circumstance, trust God. No matter what it looks like, trust God. No matter what the doctor report, trust God. No matter how bad your marriage is, trust God. No matter how bad your finances is, trust God. No matter how crazy your kids are acting, trust God. No matter how big a noise your automobile is making, chitty chitty bang bang going down, trust God. So in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17, Habakkuk makes a declaration in faith. He says, though the fig tree does not blossom and there's no fruit of the vines, and though the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food, and though the flock is cut off from the fold and there's no cattle in the stalls, yet I will choose 
to rejoice in the Lord. I will choose to shout in exultation in the victorious God of my salvation. Can I put that in our vernacular? Though the economy blows up and tanks, though I'm laid off from my job, though my bank account is in the negative, though my health is teeter-tottering, though my relationship is on the rocks, though all of these things are going on, I choose to honor and praise and magnify God. In everything, give Can I say it like this? We've learned how to be in things, in situations. Watch this. We've even planted ourselves in problems that weren't ours to plant ourselves in. We know how to be in things. The word in is not the problem. The where the in is is the problem. Because if we had as much effort given to being in him, in Christ, in God, in joy, we wouldn't have time to be in trouble, in mess, in turmoil, in confusion. Because you can't be in confusion and in God at the same time. How do I know that? Because the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. God didn't write the script. God didn't write the program. God doesn't have his DNA on confusion anywhere. In fact, if you're confused, that's a great sign that you're in it by yourself. How many is going to this roller rink thing here in a couple weeks, wherever it's at? Y'all heard rumors about that? <laughs> I'm going to invest in bubble wrap. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so um, how many ever remember going to the, the roller rink as a kid? How many ever did the hokey pokey? <laughs> you put your left foot in, you put your left foot out, put your left foot in, shake it all about. Here's what we're doing with the enemy. We don't like where we're at, so we're going to play with him. Ah, I'll put this. Ah, look at that. Ah, no, no, I'm just messing with you. I just said, oh, no, 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 I'm just really playing. But at some point, we've already put in our left foot, our right foot, our left hand, our right hand. And so then the last one is you what? You put your whole self in. But too often, we don't get our whole self out. You guys ever been fishing? And you throw out that bait, and you got an ultralight rod so you can feel every little thing. Oh, oh, he's messing with me. Ooh. So you decide, I'm going to let him play. So you let him play three, four, five times, and there ain't nothing. So you reel it in to find out he took all your food. Watch this. Same way with the devil. Got a little nibble here, a little nibble there. Oh, y'all, it's so fun, it's so fun. Boom, and he, he snatches us, and then we're, we're really in trouble. See, some of us are nodding, and some of us are terrified to nod right now. Because we find ourselves in the jaws of the enemy. Job was definitely in the will of God. How many knows the story of Job? Job was definitely in the will of God even when it appeared as though he wasn't. Lost his family, lost his possessions, lost his wealth. His wife turned on him. His health went south. He's got boils all over the place. He's sitting on a pile of ash, lancing his boils with broken pottery. It looked like... Job, what'd you do, man? What'd, what'd, what'd you, you put your whole self in, didn't you? You, you, you got messed up. You, you, you've been bit by the devil. That's what it looks like. But he was very definitely in the will, plan, and purpose of God for his life. So you cannot determine what God's will and plan and purpose for your life is based on your circumstance. You can't. Because, man, how many ever played with a Rubik's Cube? How many of you know that in order to get the Rubik's Cube to do right, you have to turn it away that it looks wrong. And many times the way that God has taken us to a new place, the direction looks totally wrong. But it's God's plan. So you can't gauge whether or not it's God by the way that it looks or the way that it feels. 
You just have to trust him in the midst of whatever it is, whether it's I feel good or I feel bad or I like this zone or I don't like this zone. Whatever it is, in the midst of all of it, I give thanks to God because he's the one in control. See, people that are walking in disobedience to the Lord can appear very successful. Now, I don't remember who it was, so I'm going to refrain from saying names. But I want to say it was a rapper, and he was making the decision. Listen very carefully what I'm telling you. He was making the decision to give his child up in a deal with the devil to have fame and fortune. And you could tell the decision is weighing heavy on him. He's got the pen in his hand, and he's back and forth, and he's back and forth. You can just see it. Oh, but there was so much pressure. TV cameras are there. All his Hollywood buddies are there. Piles of money waiting on him just to sign the dotted line. And he, you could tell he was, in a, he was in a tight spot. And he made the wrong choice. He just, oh. And he got everything he signed up for. And quite frankly, so did his kid. Listen carefully. I don't understand how someone who's made a deal with the devil can go to sleep. What do you dream about? You got everything that you wanted. Gift wrapped. Fame, fortune, money, notoriety, friends, influence, power. You got it all. So when you lay your head on the pillow at night, what is it that you dream about? I dare say most of them dream about how they could get out of the deal that they made. You want to know what I love about the life of a believer? The worst day we've ever lived is today. The worst day of our existence is today. Because tomorrow promises to be better than it ever was today. So my tomorrows get better and better and better and better and better. Why? Because that is my expectation, that is my confession, and that is the way that I throw thanks to God. Y'all hear anything I'm saying? If, I, if our road to success was paved with the bricks of thanksgiving, how many would get out of the driveway? Here's an illustration. You guys know I like word pictures. So I wrote this the other day, and I'm going to see if I can make it make sense to you. Because sometimes what I see, I don't always articulate the way I see it. So I'm going to try. Here we go. For the ones that have sold out to the enemy for the temporary. It's like they're encapsulated in a bubble that insulates them from God. It affects their vision. How many ever looked through clear plastic? You look through a, a bottle, a glass, whatever. So it affects their vision so that it's blurred and it affects their ability to hear. Ever covered your ears and tried to understand what the TV was saying, the radio was saying, whatnot? It's, it sounds real muffled. It affects their ability to feel as it is a barrier and affects their ability to even feel the touch of others. How many ever worked on a hot engine? And so you put gloves on, and while the gloves insulated you from getting burned, you couldn't feel where the nut was? This is why some may attend church with guilt or performance as a motivation, but never seem to be affected by anything that happens or anyone that's present. Because they're in this bubble. Everything's blurred, everything's muffled, and everything's desensitized. This is why obedience is so powerful and needed for the one to whom God has given instruction. When he says, go say, or go pray, or go give a prophetic word to, or go offer so-and-so money, it is strategic. It's strategic. God sees the kink in their armor or a thin spot in their bubble that as an act of kindness, it would deflate their anger, isolation, unforgiveness, 
that fills the proverbial cocoon. So here you have somebody who's encapsulated because they have chosen to serve any or, or everything or any and everyone other than the Lord. They are now, their senses are dulled to the things of God. There's some people that I've waited. I've, I've, I've witnessed to them. I've thrown invitations for, for months, sometimes years, and not just two, many years, and I've had to wait on them to get desperate. Not desperate for me, but desperate for him. Too many people come to me wanting me to get them out of their jam. I'm incapable. I feel like the, the air traffic controller person on the, on the ground with the two cones, and here you come and you're aiming for the building. I'm going, hey, this way, stop, stop. I have no control over what you do. I can direct, but I can't control you. Nor can I control your situation or circuit. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm trying to tell you right now. My job is to direct. Your job is to pay attention. There's another type of bubble that encapsulates the believer. This particular bubble is one that protects us from the outside attacks. It allows us to see clearly and to function in a heavily contaminated world without getting diseased. What inflates our bubble is the word of the Lord. And when we get deflated, we're susceptible to tears. So my daughter has a bicycle. She loves to go bicycle riding. She said, Dad, the tire won't inflate. So I went over and I looked at it, and there's a reason it won't inflate. The whole valve stem was gone. How was the valve stem gone? The tube was great, but the stem disappeared because the tire got too deflated. And as they rode, the, the, the tube shifted inside the tire until finally the rim sliced it off. So if you imagine that you're in this bubble that God has made for you to protect you and it is praise and thanksgiving and magnifying God that keeps that thing inflated to the proper pressure because if it gets deflated and starts sagging, it can get caught on rocks and debris and whatnot. It can rip that thing open. Does it only make sense to me or are you grabbing this? So let me give you five quick reasons that we should rejoice because that Thanksgiving inflates our bubble, okay? Number one, we rejoice because our names are written in heaven. I have a hard time not focusing sometimes on heaven. I have to... I have to redirect my focus intentionally to the fact that if God wanted me to constantly focus on heaven, he'd already have me there. Because I'm not there, I need to focus on the realm that I'm in, and the realm that I'm in is not yet heaven. So he has created me to function successfully in this realm. If I made it real, real simple, Adam and Eve, he said, I give you full charge and full reign. All the beasts of the field, all the fish of the sea, all the birds that you rule the earth. It's your domain. So the enemy trying to function within the realm of those rules inhabits a serpent, gets them to give the authority over to him. So Jesus says, I'll fix this. So, so he had a plan to come and bring Jesus, and Jesus took the authority that the enemy had stolen from Adam and Eve, and he gave it back to us. Here's the problem. We still are living like Adam and Eve. Calling on Jesus to do it all for us. He did it all. And he gave us back the authority that was originally given to humankind for us to rule and reign. Most of us don't understand what that means. This is a kingdom. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. He inhabits us just like we are in him. That's why Jesus, when he's telling the disciples, how long I got to be with you? Stands up with the boat. Hey, peace, be still. Storm stop. Boat stop rocking. How many of you, whenever you're looking at your pocketbook, 
pull it out. Stop lying. How about your body? Have you noticed people like to get real sick when it comes time for church? Have you noticed that? I was doing great all week, and I got up and started getting ready for church, and doggone if I didn't get 110 degree temperature. Sometimes you got to go look at yourself in the eyeballs and say, in the mighty name of Jesus, you are in every way who he says you are. You're healed. So body, stop lying. See, some of y'all think that's just, oh, that's just fanatical nonsense. Now he's just, now he's kind of crossed the line a little bit. No, it's only because you haven't experienced it. Some months ago, Pastor Jim and Tina Grounds had brought a, a friend. And after ministry, it was, it was the week that Brad Fluke was in Norman. And we went to the Brad Fluke meeting. And I didn't realize it, but she was truly walking by faith because she had no feeling in any of her feet, or any of her feet, both of her feet. And I said, how in the world do you walk? She says, I have no explanation for you except that I walk by faith. I said, okay. I said, which foot is it? She said, both of them. So I got out of my chair. I bent down. I pointed at her feet. And I said, you've lied to her long enough. This ends now. I come in feeling back to her extremities now in Jesus' mighty name. Sat back down in my chair. She hits the floor, starts bawling. What's going on? I can feel both my feet. Now watch this. Now she's mad at me. She sent word back with Jim and Tina when they were here just this last week that she thinks about me every time she stubs her toe, kicks something. It's Joel's fault. He did it. <laughs> Hear what I'm saying? But watch this. There was a season in my life I would have never spoken over feet because I didn't know that I could. I didn't know that I should. So rejoice because your name's in heaven. We would rejoice if we find out that we had a $10 million inheritance from our grandparents. Yet something greater has happened to us. We've been born into the family of God. That is not a religious statement. That is a fact, Jack. We've been born into the family of God himself. we become heirs with God and join heirs with Jesus. We are fully accepted. You don't have to feel like an outcast. You're fully accepted in the beloved. Our eternity is full of love and joy and peace. Number two, rejoice because God is providing all of your daily needs. Who provides them? Who provides them? I think sometimes we forget that. Who provides them? Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. How many of you, when you're looking at a new employer, you want to see the benefits package? What kind of insurance do I have? How much is going on my 401k? Are you matching that? How much sick leave do I get? How much PTO do I have? Do I get vacation right away? Come on. You paying mileage? Can I work from home half the week? Looking for the benefits. What about the benefits when you come into the family of God? When you're adopted, you have all the rights and privileges of a natural-born son. You don't want to hear anything at all. All the rights and privileges of a natural-born son or daughter. That eclipses anything that we, that we exchange our time for pay. Psalm 103, verse 3 says, He forgives all of our iniquities and heals all of our diseases. Then in 1 John 1, 9, he says, Listen, if, if you confess your sins, he'll forgive them. We've got to learn to cultivate gratitude and avoid complaining. You remember the children of Israel in the wilderness? Complain and remain. Some of you just say, I've been praying about this for six months, and my condition ain't been changing at all. My relationship's still in the rocks. My finances are still in the toilet. My job is still the best place to be. I just don't even like it. My kids are unruly, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry. What, 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 what does Scripture say? 
give thanks in all, oh, all things, in the midst of all things. Give thanks, and we should avoid complaining. What does complaining do? Complaining is a calling card to the demonic. Confessing the word of God is a beacon call to the Holy Spirit that says, hey, perform this one, Dad. So complaining is an alarm that tells the devil, hey, here's another dumb one giving you full reign and access. Here's a dumb dumb. Go get him. Complain and remain. You like where you're at? Most don't. Thirdly, we need to rejoice because we're privileged to be identified with him in persecution. People don't like this one. I don't want to be persecuted. And it's funny, in today's society, we are so ultra sensitive. We think if somebody calls us a name or tells us that we're following the devil on social media, oh, I'm just being persecuted for Jesus. You don't know what persecution is. It's, it's a joke. I mean, the next step, honestly, would be to have safe spaces in church. Can I go on the record? We ain't never having one of those here. Hear what I'm telling you. Got, got people more concerned about their own sensibilities and their own sensitivities than they are doing what God said do. Persecution is on its way. It's not a negative confession. It's a fact, Jack. I read the end of the book. It's coming! So we keep nursing our feelings instead of encouraging our faith to be a mighty person of God. Because listen, if you can't praise God between jobs, and if you can't praise God in sickness, and if you can't praise God in family tumult, how in the world are you going to praise God when there ain't no money without taking the mark? Ain't no water. They're tracking you. There's all kinds of stuff that's going on. Why? Because they want to destroy those that are of the God kind. And if we're so weak that a quarter inch of rain will keep us from God's house, what do you suppose is going to happen when there's a tsunami of economic and health and all that? I mean, some of you, quite frankly, you depend on medications, don't you? I mean, let's be honest. Diabetics need insulin. Thyroid meds. All kinds of stuff that we need. What are you going to do when the government says, oh, you want them Jesus people? No, we, no, we, ain't, fulfilling, we ain't fulfilling that script. What are you going to do then? This is why we need to start trusting God over headaches, arguments, emotions. Because if we can't win the battle in the small stuff, what in the world are you going to do when a real one shows up? Number four, rejoice because your suffering is not in vain. That sounds really foolish until you think about those that have sold their soul to the devil. They don't want for anything. If they want steak for every meal, they get it. If they want their Rolls Royce covered in 14 karat gold, they get it. If they want a plane like Trump, they get it. It doesn't matter what they want, they get it. If they don't like the way their city uh, is going, they can, they can call up city council, they can get it changed. They have power, they have influence, they have everything they want in this life, but they have an assurance that they will not have it in the next life. I would rather give up everything in this life in order to have everything in that life. Y'all catch anything I'm saying? This is temporary. That's eternal. Yeah. Lastly, we need to rejoice 
because Jesus is coming back. He said, comfort one another with these words. You want to know how I know that most of the church is not living right? Because when you say Jesus is coming back, that does not comfort them. That scares them. You know how I know that most Christians are not right with Jesus? Because as soon as you say, hey, have you seen what's happening in the news? He's on his way. Oh, not yet, Lord, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, yet. That means you're not right, not right, not right, not right. When you hear Jesus come, it's like, yeah, let it be today. Come on, Jesus. <sighs> Tell a lot about somebody's walk or lack thereof. Just talk about the second coming. Just talk about rapture. Just talk about how Jesus is on his way. Too many people are in and out of church, just like they're in and out of counseling, in and out of the doctor's office, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Oh, I need a breakthrough in my life, so I, I'm in. I, I'm, I'm going to serve Jesus. You get past that jam. Oh, go right back. To, whew, thank God that one's over. You don't think God doesn't know that? And he does it anyway. You want to know why? So we stand before God, just like Romans 1.20 says, none of us will have an excuse. First Thessalonians 5.18, in every situation, no matter what the circumstances, be thankful and continually give thanks to God. This is the will of God for you and me in Christ Jesus. That means when we're in weakness, praise him. In famine, praise him. In lack, in illness, in loneliness, despair, and troublesome times, praise him. I choose to give thanks for Jesus, for being an ever-present help in time of trouble. Some of y'all feel so alone, and you forgot who Jesus is. You forgot that he said he'd never leave you or forsake you. I choose to give thanks for peace, for joy, for wisdom, for another day, for the ability to win, for the destiny and assignment to overpower the enemy. I choose to give thanks for all that I have yet to do. I choose to give thanks for each one of you. When you're a thorn and when you're not. Oh, now y'all looking all holy. I choose to give thanks for this church, for this body, for our country, and for our eternal destiny and reward. There are certain benefits of marriage that you only get in marriage. There are benefits in this life that are only accessible when you're in him. Amen. Got too many people on the outside saying, hey, I want some of that. That's fine. I will show you how to be in him so you can have everything that I have access to. No, I'd rather not be in him. I'd rather you just funnel some of the stuff that you're getting from him over this way. P too many people wanting from him but don't want to be in him. Got too many people at this day and age at the 11th, 11th hour and 59 minutes and 59 seconds still playing, put your right foot in, put your right foot in. They're still doing that with God, with church, with holiness, with righteousness. In and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Here's the thing. Maybe you make it doing that. That's too big of a risk for me. Anybody played musical chairs? You remember the feeling that when you sit down and you actually get a chair? Whew, I made it this round. That's how a lot of people are living their life each day. Whew, he didn't come back yesterday. Woo! Ah, made it again. Every day is Russian roulette. But there's coming a day when the music's going to stop and the trumpet's going to blast and you're going to go sit down and there ain't going to be a chair for you. I really didn't expect this message to end with a salvation call, but it sure fits. It sure fits. 
you can't expect the benefits of a loving Heavenly Father that you have not allowed to adopt you. Because if you're not adopted, you're not in the family. If you're not in the family, you have no rights or privileges. So I'm just going to throw it out there. If Jesus is not your Lord, he's not your master, he's not your king, he's not your heavenly father, and you know it, no matter what the people around you think. You want to know something else about people in the house of God? They're excellent liars. Excellent liars. They got everybody snowed to believe that they're, you know, me, me and God, we, we like this. When really it's like, me and God, we, we like this. But they're faithful to the house. They, show, they want to help. They want to serve. They want to clean. They want this. They want that because it looks like we're all in. And the truth is they're wanting from God. They're not wanting to be in God. I'm looking for those that want to be in God. So if you're here today and you know you're on the outside and you want to be on the inside with all your heart, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to do that on purpose because you need to make up your own mind. Because if you make up your mind based on whether or not somebody else stands up, it wasn't your mind that was made up. Somebody else's mind was. You need to choose for yourself. So when you hear me count to three and I get to three, if it's you, you need to be pop goes the weasel. da 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 here it comes. It's coming quick. One, two, three. If that's you, stand right where you're at. Stand right where you're at. I'm going to tell you what I know in my knower, and you're going to think that this is something I know in the natural. It's not. I know in my knower. There are others right now that are, that are sitting that want desperately to have enough guts to stand up on the outside. Yeah. you choose this day whom you'll serve you choose it's not chosen for you choose hallelujah all right let's not leave anybody standing alone give me two or three of the same sex around each person ready set go well done got another one standing right there Come on, ladies. Where are you at? Where's my Holy Ghost ladies? Get moving. I want nobody by themselves. I got one right back here. Thank you, baby, for coming. Get in there, Mo. Hey, I'm going to say this to you mamas. Listen carefully. You guys are having an influence on those babies right now in a way that they don't know, but they know. I want everybody to pray this out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, I choose as an act of my will to give you my life. I give you my past, my now, and my forever. I ask you to please forgive me of every sin I yet carry, known and unknown, intentional and otherwise. I lay it at your feet. I ask you to be my Lord, my master, my king. From this moment forward, adopt me into your family. I confess with my mouth, and I truly believe in my heart, Jesus is Lord, and God raised him from the dead. And right now, he lives in me, and I live in him. Right now, I'm in Christ. I'm a new creation. I'm a new creature, and I have a new future. Thank you for saving me today. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Would you celebrate with these today? For those of you that caught any part of this message online, we celebrate your, your involvement, your participation at any level uh, for any length of time that you've been here. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you here at No Excuses Ministries, 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City, every Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., every Thursday evening at 6.45 p.m. So until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.